Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Philosophy Lectures for our Hybrid 101 class. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about Hume. Although, before I get started with Hume, we left off this morning uh, talking about contextualism and the Cartesian skeptical dilemma. And I want to um, say just a couple more things about that. Um, because we did it so fast, I want to just kind of go over that idea a little bit more. This is again one of these like contemporary epistemic options, and and a lot of the contemporary theories are motivated by recognizing the problems that our kind of classical theories got us into. Um, and if you remember this morning, we were talking about this kind of dilemma, this skeptical dilemma, where I've got these three claims that all seem absolutely true, or there's very good reason uh, or intuition backing them up at the very at the very least, strong intuitions backing them up. But all the claims are inconsistent. Together, all three of them together cannot be held because they involve a direct logical contradiction. So, uh, in other words, holding two of them as true entails that the third one is false. And that's why it's called a dilemma. So, like I said this morning, it's like a have you, trying to have your cake and eat it too sort of problem. And that's exactly what contextualism is trying to do. So, just to remind you really quickly, the three claims that are in the dilemma are, I know I have hands. Seems like I know I have hands. If I don't get to know I have hands, what do I know, right? There's not, that's that's pretty minimal type of knowledge I can claim for myself. Two, if I know I have hands, then I know that I'm not a handless brain in a vat. So this is keying off the fact that in order for me to know something, I can only know true things. I can't know things that are false. If my beliefs are false, they don't count as knowledge. So if I know that I have hands, then that means it's true that I have hands. And if it's true that I have hands, then that means what is not happening is some case in which I don't have hands. And guess what? One of those cases is if I'm a handless brain in a vat. If what's really going on is that my brain has been taken out of my body and hooked up to a bunch of electrodes and a computer that is running a computer simulation of all the experiences that I'm having. I'm just a brain in a vat. There are no hands involved. There's no hands. So if I know I have hands, then I know that I'm not a handless brain in a vat. The third claim is that I don't know that I'm not a handless brain in a vat. And this is supposed to be working off the same intuitions about how I don't know that I'm not in the matrix. That for all I know, that's what's going on. That I don't have the perspective to be able to tell that I'm not a handless brain in a vat. So those are three inconsistent statements. And a lot of the classical positions are kind of defined, or a lot of contemporary epistemic theories are defined in part based on which of those claims they deny. And each one has a huge burden of proof. If you're going to deny one, two, or three, you have your work cut out for you. So there's no easy answer here. All of them are tough. All of them are tough. That's like a lot of philosophy. There's no easy answers. Everything you want to say, you have to do a lot of work in order to defend but the contextualist tries to do something else. It tries to say all three of those things are true. Um, but it tries to like separate out the context in which we're evaluating each of those things. So in the second claim, we're just kind of recognizing a logical connection. That if, I, if one thing is true, then that means this other thing is false. That's just as straightforward as it gets, just straight logical connection. But with one and three, they're saying that the reason why we think it's true, that I know I have hands, is because we're usually evaluating that question, do I know I have hands, under a context where the standards for knowledge are really, really minimal, where I don't have to do a whole lot in order to have justification. But when we start talking about weird skeptical dilemmas like evil demons and things like that, then it starts to get a little tricky about um, the standards that I need to meet in order to be able to know something. So as soon as Descartes gets in the mix and starts throwing around his wacky skepticism stuff, or any philosopher starts to do it, we put on our philosopher hats, and now all of a sudden the standards are raised, and now I don't get to know that I have hands, because I don't know that I'm not a brain to vat. When I consider that possibility, when I'm like, oh yeah, I don't know I'm not in the matrix, then it seems like I have to admit that I don't know I have hands. But that's all within a context with really, really high standards. So in order for contextualism to have a sensible position here, they have to make the claim that the standards of knowledge vary. So what I need to do in order to meet the, the standard of justification in order to know something goes up and down depending on the context. And most of the time, the context is determined by something like, 
pragmatic purposes about like what do I need this knowledge for? Why does it matter whether I know it or I don't know it? Or I say that I know it or we accept that I know it versus we think I don't know it. Um, and the, the kinds of purposes we have in a philosophical mode are a little different than in our ordinary everyday sort of thing. So uh, that's how they try to explain it. But that's really counterintuitive to most philosophers. The idea that the standards of knowledge can go up and down. And I can actually be said to know something in one context and then not know it in another. That's pretty wacky too. So even that option has a pretty high burden of proof to, to back it up. So I just wanted to explain that a little bit more. Hopefully that makes sense this time around. How are you guys in the video chat? Uh, does that make sense to you guys? At least a description of this position of contextualism. Cool. Any any questions about it? Okay, cool. Then we will move on. All right, so we get to Hume. Now, I know I just brought up Cartesian skepticism again. And uh, it's a little awkward, so I apologize that that had to happen that way. But the first thing to say about Hume is that we're doing, this is still a kind of skeptical concern. Hume's problem of induction is a form of skepticism. And it's a pretty threatening one. It's one that still perplexes philosophers up into today. There has not been a really solid answer to the problem. But the way that the problem of induction works is very, very different from Cartesian skepticism. It really, we're talking about a totally different type of worry or threat to our knowledge. Okay, so kind of don't <clears throat> don't think that this directly sort of builds off of what was happening with Descartes. This is kind of taking a little different tack. There'll be there'll be some connections here. You might be able to make some connections, but um, don't don't assume that this is just kind of continuing the discussion because it's not. It's not like Hume is keying off Descartes in some sort of way. Hume's central question here is how do we have scientific knowledge or just understanding of the world? When I have knowledge of the world, how does that happen? Um, on what basis do I get this sort of knowledge? So I, I just used this title for the problem, the problem of induction. Maybe we should talk a little bit about induction versus deduction. Um, induction and deduction are two different ways of reasoning. They're two different types of arguments that we can make. Um, you may have heard the word deduction before from like Sherlock Holmes or something like that. Uh, and uh, Sherlock Holmes is often said to be a master of deduction. Well, he is not a master of deduction. He is a master of induction. Deduction is like uh, deriving a conclusion from premises in a way that is absolutely and necessarily true. Let me, let me give you a quick example. There's going to be a little bit of uh, formal logic symbols here, but I'll explain it and... Uh, I mean, this pattern of reasoning is not going to be unfamiliar to you. Oh, and then... Uh, maybe I'll talk about that uh, later, Lawrence, but let, let's come back to that after the lecture is over. Um, now that I'm rolling on Hume, I don't want to go, go back to Descartes. Um, okay, so here's an argument. This is called standard form. I think I might have shown it to you guys before in class. What we've got here are a number of different claims. We've got the claim. Uh, these are the premises up here. And then this is the conclusion. This little symbol here just means therefore. Um, so up here, P and Q just stand for whatever things you like. Like uh, here, I'll do a quick example. Um, <clears throat> coin, All right? Here's one claim. The coin is in my left hand. Here's another claim. The coin is in my right hand. Those are just two different claims. They could be true or false. We don't know yet. But what this argument is saying is it's saying, hey, well, I know that the coin is either in the left hand or it's in the right hand. Okay, so that's like I tell you, here's a coin. Okay. Coin is in my left hand or it's in my right hand. Okay, so that's all that this first premise is saying. The second one is saying that that first thing is not happening. This squiggle just means not. So the, the wedge means or, and the squiggle just means not. So it means it's not in the left hand, let's say. 
Therefore, what do we get to conclude? What do we know? If I know the coin has to either be in the left hand or the right hand, and I know it's not in the left hand, then that means it's got to be in the right hand, right? Okay. So <clears throat> this is some formal logic. This is a deductive inference. And what that means is that as long as these two premises are actually true, as long as they're actually true, then the conclusion must be true. What that means is that well, this, is, this is what we mean when we say that an argument is valid, if it meets the standard of validity. It's saying that as long as the premises are true, if the premises are true, then it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. It must be true. It's absolutely guaranteed. It's necessarily true. There's no way for you to imagine a scenario in which this is false and these two things are true. You just can't do it. Those kinds of formal logical relationships between claims, this kind, these kinds of reasoning patterns, is the world of deductive logic. But most deductive logic, uh, or most of the things that we know, are not known on this kind of basis. So um, here's, here's another thing. We'll be coming back to this example uh, a few times during this lecture. So here's an object, and I let go of it. Falls to the ground. Falls to the ground. Okay. Do I know that the next time, if I let go of this in a second, what's going to happen? It's going to fall to the ground, right? You know that. How do you know that? Do you know that on the basis of logical deductive validity? No. So, and this is skipping ahead a little bit, but um, this is perfect timing. The argument kind of looks like this. Based on a bunch of past experience, okay, past experiences, I conclude the pen will fall. Is it possible that every time in the past when I let go of a pen, it falls to the ground, and yet the next time the pen will not fall? Can I imagine that? The answer is yes. There's nothing stopping me from having that thought. It is a logically possible thought because it doesn't involve any kind of contradiction. I do get into a contradiction when I try to imagine these things true and this false. There will be a contradiction there if I try to do that, but not so in this case. And that's going to be a very important feature here of uh, Hume's different categories of knowledge, and, and this is a categorization that still lasts until today. Inductive reasoning, in a nutshell, is just any type of reasoning where the premises that I offer do not ensure the truth of the conclusion, but they definitely give me good reason to think that the conclusion is true. This isn't an irrational form of reasoning. At least it doesn't seem like it. This seems like a very ordinary and everyday and certainly legitimate way of trying to reason about the world. It doesn't have all the uh, assurances of deductive validity, but it still seems like I can get knowledge this way. This is induction. This is deduction. So when we say Sherlock Holmes is a master of deduction, we're really not saying that he's a master of deduction. He is really a master of induction. If you've ever like watched the BBC Sherlock, which I very much enjoy and probably would I would recommend that. BBC Sherlock's great. Or like any of the old uh, Basil Rathbones or or just have read the gosh darn books, why not, huh? Um, then you'll know that most of what Sherlock Holmes uses in order to draw his conclusions is a bunch of empirical evidence of knowledge about the world. Stuff that does not have absolute logical necessity to it. It's like, really, Sherlock Holmes is very observant, and he knows a lot about the patterns about how the world works. And he uses those two things to come to his conclusions. So he's not really doing this kind of deductive reasoning. He's really doing a very complicated version of this kind of reasoning. Um, and that, that's kind of the fun of the, of the stories, is that He's got this like long chain of reasoning that he goes through. It's very complicated, but each step of it is really just uh, an inductive step. Okay? So induction is what we're here to discuss tonight with Hume. Hume's not wondering about how do we know that logical truths hold. He's really interested in this kind of stuff. How do we have knowledge of the world? So um, we've kind of foreshadowed some of the things we're going to be talking about here. But the next thing that we, I think to frame things, well, let me put it this way. 
one of the reasons why I assigned this reading at all for you, why I wanted us to do Hume, is that uh, at the very beginning here, and how he sets up the problem of induction, he gives us a bunch of really, really important philosophical distinctions. Uh, these are kind of like uh, some of the basic conceptual vocabulary that philosophers are using uh, in many, many, many discussions in metaphysics and epistemology, and even a little bit into ethics, too. Um, uh, actually, definitely into ethics, too. Um, so uh, the categories that, that Hume is putting up here, at the very beginning of the reading, he talks about the difference between uh, knowledge of matters of fact and knowledge of relations of ideas. So what Hume is really doing here is he's saying, okay, knowledge, knowledge, this big category of knowledge, comes in two flavors. Relations of ideas. And matters of fact. Okay, now this is supposed to be an absolute and exhaustive categorization of all knowledge. That's a big claim that Hume is making. But it, we'll look at what he has to say about it. And I think you 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 might agree that this is pretty much the only options. That all of our knowledge has got to be either a relation of ideas or a matter of fact. Okay. Now there, and there, we'll, we'll get into some of the, the places where this might be challenged. Uh, that's going to come up in the next couple of readings, but uh, maybe we'll even talk about it a little bit tonight. But um, this is how Hume is sort of carving things up or setting up the problem of induction. Is first he's like, well, let's just take stock of knowledge. Knowledge comes in these kind of two different flavors, these are two different types of knowledge that we can have, um, and they're different from each other. And he's really interested in this one. I mean, this is. What he wants to investigate and what he wants to analyze is how we have knowledge of matters of fact. That's knowledge about how the world is, what state the, the universe exists in. Like, is there water in my cup or not? That is a matter of fact. Whether um, uh, drinking um, five gallons of uh, vodka will kill you, that's a matter of fact. If it's true, it's a matter of fact. It's not just a matter of relations of ideas. Let, let's talk a little bit more about what this distinction is. And along the way, as we categorize these, these two different flavors of knowledge, we're going to get different properties. These things are going to work in different ways. And it's these distinctions that I really want you guys to know and understand. It'll be, if you go on and study more philosophy, this stuff will be really, really useful to you. Okay. Um, first, let me give you some examples. Uh, I already gave you some examples of matters of fact. Um, matters of fact are going to just be about, like, states of affairs in the world. Um, like I used that example this morning of like, did I lock the house when I left this morning? That kind of thing. Will the bus arrive at at like 1221 or not? That's a matter of fact. Anything about the world at all is going to be a matter of fact. It's about the world because... It depends on the world. That's one of the big things that's going to categorize matters of fact. Um, matters of fact are about the world because whether or not a matter of fact is true or it's false depends on what's going on in the world. Like whether or not, so I give you a claim. Uh, T Rex says. T-Rex makes this claim, the glass has water in it. Is it true or is it false? I don't know. Well, what's going to make it true? Is it going to be true because we believe it? No, no, no. That would be a relativistic account of truth, that it's true just because I believe it. It's like wishing makes it so or something like that. That's not how these things work, at least not for good hard-headed realists like most human beings. And most philosophers too, but there's a few of us who have slipped through the cracks. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go further than that. We're going to take it for granted that realism is the right option here. And under realism, what would make a matter of fact true or false has got to be something about the world. Is there, in fact, water in the cup? That there's a world out there, there's cups, and there's water. Is there water in this particular cup? 
the world having that be true would make T-Rex's statement true. It is the truth maker. So when we talk about matters of fact, the reason why they're true is, is going to depend on the, what's happening with the world. Okay. Um, relations of ideas, let's give you some examples for relations of ideas. Relations of ideas are going to be things like logical truths. So like that little uh, P or Q, not P, therefore Q. Uh, that is a valid argument, and if I make that claim, I know that it is true. Why do I know that it's true? Is it because of something going on in the world that makes it true? Are logical truths truths about the world? That's not how most people think about them. Most people think about logical truths as just conceptually true, that they're entailed in virtue of the concepts involved. It's like 2 plus 2 equals 4. What makes that true? Not the world being a certain way, not the states of affairs in the world turning out such that every time I check, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Uh, rather, it's just what 2 is, it's what addition is, it's what equality is, it's what 4 is. If I know all those concepts, then I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So those are good examples of relations of ideas. They're not about the world. So we're going to add that to our little map here. Not about the world. Okay. So we're getting a little further here. So we know that one of the things that re that's the difference here between relations of ideas and matters of fact is that matters of fact, if they're going to be true, depend on how the world is, whereas relations of ideas don't. They depend more on just the relations between ideas, conceptual connections, or things that we might say are true by definition. Uh, a classic example here that philosophers seem to always love. I don't know why this one caught on so much, but uh, the one you'll hear every once in a while in the literature, mostly from mid-20th century, I guess, um, is bat all bachelors are unmarried men. So T-Rex just made a claim here a second ago that was a matter of fact. What if he says... What if he says, all bachelors are unmarried? So he makes this claim. Is it true or false? What is going to make it true or false? Is it going to depend on the world? No, nope, not really. It really just depends on the conceptual definition of bachelor. That if we're, if we're defining bachelors as unmarried men, then it will be true that all bachelors are unmarried. That is true by definition, by the concept. Um, Maybe you want a different definition of bachelor that doesn't that is not unmarried man, but um, regardless of whatever definition you want, there's still a concept here. We can we can dispute the label of this word bachelor or something like that, but there's a concept. We'll refer to that concept with this particular word, and that concept has certain truths about it, and there are th certain things that we can derive just in virtue of the definition. Okay, so that would be that would be a relation of ideas. Okay, so that gives us, that gets us kind of in the ballpark for this distinction, but there's a couple more, um, th these are the distinctions I've been alluding to that are a little more precise and re very, very helpful for us to have some deeper philosophical understanding here. Whoa, that water just shot right out of the cup in my face. All right, let's start with this. Another way that we can distinguish relations of ideas from matters of fact is what it takes in order for us to know them. And in particular, we'll be interested in one very big time, high profile source of knowledge that we've been talking about uh, in passing quite a few times, and that is experience. Seems like we use experience to gain knowledge, but what kind of knowledge? Is it relations of ideas or matters of fact? Well, let's start with matters of fact. In order to know matters of fact, well, okay, let, let's start with what we already observed. Matters of fact are about the world because they depend on the world. The world is the truth maker for matters of fact. So that means that if I'm going to know that a certain matter of fact is true, that it obtains in reality, then that means for me to have a position to be able to know that, it's going to require some experience. So we're going to say that matters of fact are known, and here's the fancy word, A posteriori. All that means 
like whether a claim is a posteriori just means that in order to know that claim, in order to know that it's true, it requires experience. I can only have the knowledge after experience, posterior to experience. That's why we call it a posteriori. Okay? So if matters of fact, if they're going to be true, they depend on the world. It seems like I'm going to have to have some experience of the world to be able to know that they're true, to have a legitimate basis to justify my belief that the claim is actually true. Okay, so even, and there might be other things that are going to get in the way here that are going to undermine my knowledge, but at the very least, we know it's going to be mandatory. If we're going to know it at all, it's got to be known on the basis of experience. Okay, now, in contrast to that, relations of ideas, we say are known a priori. So you got a posteriori, you got a priori. Those are kind of the two ways of knowing. So let's let's mark that just to, so that we're very clear here. You know, Hume's been trying to divide up these categories of everything that we know. And one of the big things that's going to divide these two categories is how we know them. What way of knowing is required in order to have that kind of knowledge? And whether things are known on the basis of experience or where they're not known on the basis of experience is going to be a very big deal. Uh, a priori just means I know it prior to experience. Now, that I know some of you guys are going to be wondering about this because you're going to be like, well, 2 plus 2 equals 4. You just said that was a relation of ideas. But I don't know that without experience. I needed to have some experience in order to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, I'm thinking of my own life experience where... My mother taught me how to count by point, putting some coins on the table. I was homeschooled, so it wasn't a teacher. Well, my mom was my teacher. She was a certified teacher, too, so she knew what she was doing. But she put some coins on the table, and she took two coins over here, and I counted them. One, two, and then two coins over here. One, two, and then we put them together, and then we count them up. One, two, three, four. Boom, four. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's almost like we did a little experiment, right? We like take the situation, set it up right, see what happens. Oh, 2 and 2 put together become 4. Oh, man. And so I had some experience that got me familiar with these relationships. But would I say that my evidence for knowing that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is that experience? No. That's not what, what we probably want to say. Maybe it took an experience to acquaint me with the concepts or to recognize that there was a connection between these ideas. But what makes it true? It's not the world. The world is not making it true. It's just the concepts themselves. And if I'm justified in thinking that 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's not because I ran a bunch of experiments and it worked out every time and that's how I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's just not the way that we would understand the legitimacy of mathematical relationships because and here's why if 2 plus 2 equals 4 or any other relation of idea was known on the basis of experience then that means that maybe some experience could happen in the future that would prove that it's false in other words it's falsifiable this is true of all of the things that we know about the world that we think are facts it's always possible that they can be overturned by some future experience and that is exactly what has happened countless times in the history of science Scientists have come up with a hypothesis that seems to explain how things are going or describes and predicts what happens in reality. And then sooner or later, something comes along that controverts that hypothesis. And then we're like, oh, it's not the case. It's been falsified by this other experience. We, it's always possible that, that this could happen. Um, maybe all of a sudden, like gravity, the gravitational constant changes in the universe. It's always possible that something like that could happen. And then everything that we would know would be upturned. But it doesn't seem like it is in principle possible to falsify the claim that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Can you imagine even a possible experience that would show me that that's false? I challenge you. I don't think you'll be able to do it. If you think you've got an answer, I'd love to hear it. And we'll, enter, we'll take a look at it and see whether it holds water. But I think you will probably fail at trying to do that. Okay. Um, in the chat, how are we doing so far? I want to take just a little time out. We've, we've been talking for about 25 minutes on this. Um, I'm about to lay down some more stuff, but this is a big this is a big step right here, this distinction between a priori and a posteriori, and I want to make sure we're good on it um, and see if you guys have any questions before I, I go on and do some more stuff.
I'm confused by your question, Lawrence. I don't know what chair means. Changing chair to mean four? Uh, uh, oh, it's a joke. Okay, I'm stupid. I'm sorry. I didn't pick up on that. Um, so do you believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4 just because people have told you that it's true? I don't think so. I don't think this is something I know on the basis of authority. I think I'm able to kind of derive it and confirm it for myself. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, if you if you muck around with um, what words mean, then yeah, all bets are off. I mean, two plus two could not equal four if by four we mean five. I mean that that's that's always granted here. But we're talking about keeping the con the concepts constant that they're not they're not changing their meanings or something like that. There's no funky business going on here with uh, how we change the definitions of words. If that's true, I mean, all logic can always fall apart. You just make words mean different things. But that's not really about these relationships, these logical connections. It's really about the relationships between the concepts that makes those things true. And changing words does not mean you're changing concepts. Did I get you right on that, Lawrence? I'm not sure if I if I got what you're asking, but how are the rest of you guys doing? Any other questions too? So consensus is really not relevant here for either relations of ideas or matters of fact. So matters of fact is not even set by consensus. We might decide that we're going to treat something as a fact based on some kind of consensus but only because we think that the consensus in somehow provides more evidence that it's actually the case um, and even there it's possible that our best consensus could get overturned like for example when everyone thought the world was flat they were wrong cool all right so are we ready for more? Bring it. All right. Let's do this. Okay, so this is a distinction between how we know that these things are true. On what basis do we have the knowledge? Okay? Um, there's one other distinction here. I made these little boxes for it. And it is the analytic synthetic distinction. Now, the analytic synthetic distinction is supposed to be a distinction in the logical form of these kinds of claims, so that these claims are making different kinds of claims. And let me kind of show you how, what this means. Um, and by the way, let, let's use another example here of something that's true uh, because it's a relation of ideas, because I like this example more for where we're going to go next. Uh, let's say that T Rex says, the red car is red that's true right it's always true whenever anyone says that it's gonna be true uh, and it's true because of the concepts involved in the claim and the relationships between them not because of anything about the world it doesn't depend on the world to be true um, this claim is always true just in virtue of the concepts involved and this is a really really good example of an analytic claim so probably you've learned from English that uh, all claims have two components to them. They've got a subject and they've got a predicate. The subject is what the sentence is about or what the claim is about, and the predicate is what we're saying about it. So in this example here, this right here, that's the subject. And down here, this thing, that's the predicate. Put them together, you get a full claim. Without a subject, no claim. 
without a predicate, no claim. It's just unintelligible what we're talking about. If I say the red car, you can't say that that's true or false. It's just not. It's not uh, the thing that bears truth values. It's not truth apt. That's another phrase we like to use in philosophy. Um, also, what if I just gave you a predicate? I just said, is red. Deal with that. You disagree? Is red? Doesn't make any sense. Uh, can't be true or false. So if we're going to have a claim, the kind of thing that can be true or false, something that is saying something is true, we're going to have to have a subject and we're going to have to have a predicate. Now, how does this have anything to do with analytic synthetic distinction? Well, and I'm going to use a little bit of Kantian terminology. If you go through my lecture notes, you'll see me talk about that and go on a little tangent for very, very briefly um, about Kantian logic. I think I think actually Kant is on to something. He, he's got a little bit of a wacky way of talking about logical relationships, but for our purposes, uh, this really fits closer to what Hume is talking about because Kant is working straight off of Hume when he c comes up with his logic. He's very influenced by him. Um, and this, I, the metaphor that we get, the logical metaphor we get from Kant is this idea of containment, about whether the predicate is conceptually contained within the subject. And in this case, it's pretty easy to tell that there is that kind of containment relationship taking place. That the concept of being read is already there, up there in the subject, right? See it right there, the red car. I can't have a red car without knowing about redness. I can't think of a red car without being familiar with this concept of red. So if I'm just saying the red car is red, this meaning of this concept right here, what we're predicating when we talk about the predicate here, is really something that was already brought up. It was already posited by just asserting the, well, you can't assert subjects, but by positing a subject that then we want to say something about, um, that conceptual content has already been established. It's already present there as soon as we posit a red car. So I say red car, and then you're like, okay, what are you going to say about it? And I say it's red. Then it's like I already knew that. I mean, if you you thought you made me think of a red car, I'm already thinking about red. Concept was already brought up. Okay, that's what it means to say a claim is analytic. That the subject contains the predicate. Predicates already contained there in the subject. Okay, so sometimes claims are like this. And in fact, if we talk about two plus two equals four. We're doing the same sort of thing. We're saying that really the concept of four is already present there in two plus two. It's really already there. This is just another way of writing the concept, but it's really the same concept. Um, this is sort of connected with how mathematics is based off of logic. And logic, even logic, seems to be just showing us what is already contained in the concepts we already have. Remember when we did that whole process of elimination thing? Let me draw it up for you again. Boom, here we go. P or Q, not P, therefore Q. One way of understanding this that a lot of logicians are very happy to use this metaphor, I don't see many people denying this one, is that the notion, the information of Q is really already present up here with the information I'm getting from the premises. It's just that it might not be obvious to me, and it takes some maybe logical work. I could do some truth tables. I won't go through truth tables right now, but we could do some little logical analysis using our logic systems to be able to confirm that this information is already present by positing this information. So really, if you treat this as the subject and this is the predicate, then the predicate's already contained there in the subject. Now that's a little bit of wackiness there. I'm, I'm playing a little fast and loose with concepts. I'm not being very technically accurate here. But this sort of relationship of information being contained in other information, that's what we're getting, for, get, getting at when we're talking about a claim being analytic. Okay? Now lots of claims, are not analytic. Because, I mean, notice this. Why can I know a claim a priori? Well, I could know that it's a priori if its truth just depends on these relationships between the concepts that are involved in the claim. Like, the red car is red is analytically um, constructed, and because of that, I know it's true a priori. I don't need any experience. I don't need to know anything about how the world is. It's not about the world. It's really about the concepts that are involved in the claim. And that's what the truth depends on. That is the truth maker for this kind of for these claims that are relations of ideas. Okay, but now let's talk about the synthetic claims. Synthetic claims are different. Synthetic. Let, let's get, let's take a real classic uh, example of a synthetic claim here.
I'll give you a couple examples so you can see this happen. Um, first, let's do this one. The glass is full of water. What's the subject? Well, it's the glass. Yeah, come on. The glass. That's our subject. What's the predicate? What are we saying about that subject? Well, we're saying, you know, that it's full of water. You know, cups do that. Sometimes. Not all the time. This predicate is not conceptually contained in the thought of the glass. If I just think of a glass or the glass, a particular glass, like my my bear's glass here. I know I'm wearing a Seahawks hat, but the bears are real my true love. Um, if I'm talking about a particular glass, just thinking about that glass doesn't get me to think that it's full of water. And in fact, I can imagine it not being full of water. Okay, So it could go either way. It's possible either way. Uh, just positing the concept of the subject is not enough for me to get the predicate. So if there's going to be a connection between the subject and the predicate such that the claim is going to come out true, that's not going to be established just on the basis of the relationships between the ideas that are involved in the claim. Here's another one. Sometime in the future, it'll be true that Tim is dead. This is another synthetic claim. Being Tim doesn't automatically entail being dead. Okay, so by just positing this subject, I have not yet posited the predicate. So that's a synthetic sort of claim. It might be true that Tim is dead. It might not be true that Tim is dead. You could have Tim, and he might be dead, or he might be alive. We don't know. Both things are possible. And that's a big thing. That's the next big step here. So, uh, so far so good here on analytic synthetic. You guys see the difference here between the structure? It's because synthetic claims... The, the predicate of a synthetic claim is not guaranteed in virtue of the subject that something else has to link these things together. And the thing that's going to do that when we're talking about a synthetic claim, the thing that's going to be the bridge here that's going to connect the subject and the predicate because they're not conceptually connected is going to be, you guessed it, the world. Whether it's true in the world, the world is going to be the means of connecting this subject and this predicate. And that is why synthetic claims need to be known a posteriori. They need to be known on the basis of experience because they're about the world, because their truth depends on the world. And I need to know something about the world in order to know that they're true. Okay, there's a question here from Lawrence. So how does that relate to a glass filled water is full of water? When the predicate is in the subject, does that change the parameters or no, since it could still be imagined as empty? Okay, so you're, you're kind of thinking about it the wrong way here. So by saying, let's look at this claim. A water-filled glass is full of water. When I posit a water-filled glass, boom, I already get it's full of water. That The predicate is conceptually contained in the subject. So this is always true. The thing that you're imagining is not the opposite of that claim. You're just imagining there isn't a glass filled with water. But that is not what we need to imagine when we're trying to imagine the opposite. The question, so the real, so you got this claim that says a water-filled glass is full of water. The opposite of that claim is not there is no glass. It's that a water-filled glass is not filled with water. And that involves a contradiction, right? You can't have a water-filled glass that's not filled with water. You could, yeah, I mean, well, that's the point here about claims that are relations of ideas. They are always true or always false because they're just true or false based on the concepts involved. There's nothing contingent about them. The world could work out all sorts of different ways. We don't know. But the, so the contrary, but the contrary of any relation of ideas is always, any true relation of ideas is always false. So Let's go back to the red car is not re uh, the red car is red. That claim being false would mean that the red car is not red. But that's a contradiction. How can you have a red car that's not red? Again, I challenge you to try to come up with a scenario where that's actually true. And I'm guessing that all your attempts are really going to be false or involve some kind of equivocation where how you're using red in the first part of that sentence is not conceptually equivalent to the way that you're using it in the second part of the sentence. Okay? You can't have red cars that aren't red. You can't have glass-filled waters that are not full of, or 
water-filled glasses that aren't full of water, right? Uh, so any any sort of contrary to a relation of ideas must be false, necessarily, because the, what makes it true is just the conceptual connections, and those things are necessary. Whereas matters of fact, because they are synthetic, because the predicate is not already established by the subject, you can imagine the subject with or without the predicate. So the contrary to any matter of fact is still possible. Is it true that there is water in my glass? Yes, it is true. Is it possible that the glass does not have water in it? Yes, it's still possible even when it's false. That's the key thing here. So, um, well, okay, maybe I just made things more confusing. All right, let, let me just write it up and so you guys can really see it. Let's take a couple examples here. One synthetic, one analytic, and you'll see how uh, they've got this asymmetry going on here with imagining the contrary, which is a big thing that Hume makes a big deal about this. So, oh man, it's already been 45 minutes. I can't believe it. Oh man, it takes so much time to get through this stuff. Okay, um, so we've got... The red car is red. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of those claims is analytic, one of those is synthetic. Red car is red, that's analytic. Glass has water in it, that's synthetic. Predicate is not contained in the subject. So when I imagine the contrary, I'm imagining... Um, the red car is not red, which is a contradiction. The glass does not have water in it. Notice the structure that happened here. The, the subject has been kept the same. The red car is red. The red car is not red. Still got the red car in both cases. The glass has water in it. The glass does not have water in it. Subject's the same. It's the predicate that's flipped. It's either the predicate is present or it's not present. Okay? So this one, the red car that's not red, that's a contradiction. This is impossible. This can never happen. You can never have a red car that's not red. Never ever. But how about the glass does not have water in it? Is that possible? Yes. That is possible. And even if it is true that the glass has water in it, it is still possible that the glass does not have water in it still possible. Okay? It's not like the possibility has been removed. I think part of what's going on here is that we might have some wacky intuitions here about the nature of possibility, actuality, and necessity. I think a lot of times we think if it's actually true, then it's necessarily true. If we're saying something is necessarily true, that means it's impossible for it to be false. But there are so many things that are possible, that are logically possible. That means that they're, the thought of them does not involve a contradiction even though they are, the thing is actually true. So even though it's, there is water, so you can see some water, there is actually water in this cup. It's still possible that it doesn't have water in it because I can imagine that state of affairs without contradiction. And if, like, what if I just took a big slurp a second ago? Instead of taking the modest sip that I took, what if I took a big slurp? Then there wouldn't be any water anymore. That was a possibility. Definitely possible. Okay? Could I not be wearing a hat right now? Yep, totally possible. Makes sense to say that that's possible. I am still wearing the hat, though. It's happening right now. Okay, so that that might help c clear up any confusion that's going on there. Are, is that making sense to you guys in the chat? Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. All righty. So. All of this has just been to set this up, and that's a big accomplishment. I mean, I was figuring we're probably going to talk about Hume a little bit on Wednesday, so we'll definitely be doing that. But this is really important distinctions. The most important thing that Hume is saying here at the outset is that these boundaries between relations of ideas and matters of fact are absolute. There's no crossover. So in other words, you can't get an analytic claim that is known a posteriori, that doesn't make any sense. And you also can't have a synthetic claim that's known a priori. These things are all sort of linked up together. And hopefully the explanations I've given of each of these properties 
um, has shown you what at least Hume thinks is the logic about why that divide is so absolute, about why analytic claims can be known a priori, why synthetic claims can't be known a priori, and why synthetic claims have to be known a posteriori, how they have to be known on the basis of experience. You okay? okay. Um, all right. So whew, let's get back to what we were doing originally. Remember, Hume wants to understand matters of fact. He wants to understand how we have knowledge of this. What is our knowledge of matters of fact based upon? Um, and what, how, how can we reason about this stuff? How are we supposed to do science? Hume is uh, doing all this philosophical work right in the birth of the scientific revolution in the, in the, um, in the Enlightenment here, okay, early modern period. And with the advent of like experimental science, which is this new way of doing things, um, the Baconian inductive method. Maybe you've heard of Francis Bacon. Pretty big deal in the birth of what we would recognize as modern science. I mean, natural philosophy had been going on for hundreds of years, but there was a big change that was about to happen, especially with now that we could do calculus and uh, like Descartes' advancement of being able to use algebra to understand geometry. That really just opened up science to become something totally different than how it was before. Um, and everything that you've been taught about science is really just kind of like post-enlightenment science, like what science turned into after that. And Hume is right here at the birth of it. And so as people are trying out these new ways of reasoning and new ways of investigating and thinking about reality in the natural world, it is very reasonable to ask what are the rational standards that serve as a basis for what we're doing. We, want, we don't want to just be doing something because it seems that it's right. We really want that certainty. You know, Descartes wanted that certainty. He wanted to make some lasting contribution to the sciences, and he couldn't do that if he didn't understand the epistemic basis on, from, from which he was trying to derive what he thought was knowledge, or what we presume is knowledge. Okay? So we've got to hold this to some kind of critical rigor. Scientists are not just people who are sitting around and being like, uh, I think this is true, or I collected a bunch of data and I just think that it made me, maybe it kind of was like this. I don't know. It's just what it sort of seems to be like. That's not how scientists do things. They're trying to be really, really rigorous and holding themselves to rational standards here. But those rational standards need to be investigated. And it's really philosophers that paved the way for modern science. But as they were doing this, as they were developing the techniques that now we just take for granted in how we do science, they were also being critical of it along the way. And I think some of that criticism has been forgotten about. And this is why people need to study some more philosophy to keep an eye on that, all, what we're sort of doing with science, rather than just treating it as some sort of arbitrary authority that we put our faith in. Because that's not how science wants to be taken. That's never been its intention. It hasn't been that there are certain, you might say, magical medicine men that are the scientists that somehow have some like secret knowledge about reality that none of us have and they can't really explain it to us and it's totally unprincipled or just based on intuition or some other superstitious whatever. Okay? We're trying to hold ourselves to critical standards and that means critical rational standards as well. And that's what Hume is trying to investigate. That's what he is trying to uncover so that we can know that the way that we're proceeding in doing science is not getting us on the wrong track. So we know we're actually getting to some sort of truth here. So. Here's the first big step of Hume's analysis of scientific reasoning. And, it, and this is what we call induction. All of science is based on experience and experiential observation. That puts us firmly in this category, right? Because what scientists are trying to do is understand the world. The knowledge they seek depends on how the world is. They want to know matters of fact. They want to know how reality is set up. And all of the claims, every Every, even the ones, even these things that are that look like mathematical formulas, like Newton's laws or Einstein's laws or all this crazy quantum physics stuff that gets that happens, or Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, all of those things are still known a posteriori. They're not known on just straight deduction. It's not just math that is proving things in science. Okay, and as we do different experiments, our old scientific models, which were also formulas that were based on mathematics, can get disproven. That means that what scientists, is, scientists are doing, if they get any knowledge at all, it's knowledge that's arrived at a posteriori. Depends on experience. Okay? So science is here. Okay? Logic is here. And scientists use logic. But not, and that's the whole thing about like how you're using math as a part of like understanding like subatomic physics or something like that. Okay? But it's not like it's just pure math. 
And even the, the scientists, if they're honest, are going to tell you that too. I don't know of any physicist who's like, oh yeah, all I'm doing is math. It's just math. That's not the case. Okay. So, Hume's major, his first major observation here, or bit of analysis about induction, is that if I know any matter of fact, it requires me to know it on the basis of some kind of causal reasoning. So let's take um, let's take one of his examples. Um, I want to make a conclusion here. I'm going to keep using the standard form thing of premises and conclusions with that bar and the and the triforce triple dot thing here. So let's say I want to say that there was. So I I get up on it. I boating around and. I discover this desert island in the middle of the Pacific, and then I conclude that there was a human on this island. And if I'm going to know that this is true, I got to have some evidence, okay? So I'm going to make this conclusion, and I got to base it off some kind of evidence. So I mean, it's a it's a claim about the world, so I got to have some experience of the world. So let's say my experience of the world uh, reveals to me that. There is a pocket watch on the island. So, you know, I'm walking around the island, this desert island, and I stumble upon a pocket watch. And the pocket watch is not just, like, washed up on the beach or something like that. Like, I've always had students, like, give me trouble with this thought experiment. So I'm going to try to head off all the trouble ahead of time here. Okay, so let's imagine I'm walking around on the beach. And I'm I'm in the middle of the island, like like maybe a mile or two away from the coast, and there like I see something kind of buried, and I I dig it up, and it's a little chest, and inside the chest is a pocket watch. I mean I got the chest in here now, but that's fine too. I mean whatever. So I I see you know like maybe there's a sign or something. I don't whatever. However you like, it's gonna work either way. So I observe that there's a pocket watch on the island. Therefore I conclude that there must have been a human on this island. And that seems like a reasonable inference. Would you guys in the chat agree? Is that a good inference? Yeah. Sure seems like it to me. Sure seems like I'm not off my rocker here in drawing that conclusion. Um, is it definitive evidence? In other words, is it something that I know a priori? No. Because this truth doesn't just depend on the concepts involved here. Is it possible? Like, let's go back to the deduction versus induction, these different ways of knowing, right? Could this be true and this false? Yep, yeah, yeah. Lawrence, you said it could have fallen out of an airplane. Yep, that's right. It could have fallen out of an airplane, but I'm not going to think that that's true, okay? Um, why? Maybe not absolute. It sure seems this is a good sign that this is true. It doesn't maybe give a totally airtight case for the conclusion, but it gives me really strong evidence. That's induction. But here's, here's Hume's first really big point, that if I'm going to know this on the basis of this, I, it's not just this all by itself. It's not the pocket watch, boom, pocket watch, therefore human. What is, what is it that I might be taking for granted? There might be a what we call a suppressed premise. There might be some claim up here that I'm taking for granted, um, that coupled with this observed fact that there's an observed pocket watch on the island, that would let me conclude that there was a human on this island. And what might that be? What might that hidden premise be? What might I be assuming is true? Boom, you got it, Lawrence. The box and the pocket watch had to be built by a human. Watches are made by humans, Rob says. That's exactly the that's exactly right. In other words, it's a claim I make about causality. That any time I want to use some observed fact, some state of affairs, in order to justify me in believing that there's some other thing that's true, it always depends on some kind of causal reasoning. In other words, I have to assume that there's certain causal laws that take place. I have to assume, or I have to have the knowledge, that something like little uh, sand crabs are not building pocket watches, that that's not how they are created, or that there's a pocket watch tree, and the tree just grows the pocket watches, that these could be the causes of pocket watches. No, nope. I know, well, it seems like I know, that pocket watches are made by human beings, and that is maybe the only cause of them on this planet. Okay, So 
pocket watches got to be created by humans. That's what lets me infer this from this. Okay. All right. Now, Hume says, so we're, we're sort of tracing things backwards here. If I want to know a certain matter of fact, like there was a human on this island, that's going to be based on something from experience coupled with my knowledge of the causal laws. Okay. Um, this is true even when we do some like weird Cartesian things where I'm like, there's a glass in my hand. How do I know that? Well, I know that because I'm having the sensations of a glass being in my hand. But you see there's another hidden causal assumption there too, right? That the cause of my experience must be an actual glass that's in an actual hand. Okay, so it's the same logic here. Any matter of fact depends on a causal inference. It requires me to know something about causality in order to have some knowledge. And this is true even for the most high-level, sophisticated, theoretical, scientific claims. That it all scientific claims are happening against a backdrop of background assumptions about how causal laws work. And this gets us into trouble sometimes, and that's why these things have to be continually reevaluated. But I also, in order to reevaluate my fundamental assumptions about the laws of causality, it requires me to posit more causality. And most of science is really about just kind of fitting these things together. Like, I have to make this, I have to make this claim. Okay, how do I get these things to work together? How do I get all this stuff to be consistent? If you've ever studied any kind of, um, if you've gone sort of deep at all in studying physics, you'll see that that's a lot of what's going on here. We, we're like observing all these different relationships. And we're trying to figure out how do they fit all together. And sometimes we get into trouble when we're trying to make it consistent. And that's why we still don't have a gut, a grand unified theory, which scientists crave more than anything else. It's a holy grail for science, a grand unified theory of science, where everything fits together. All the different sciences that we do all are put together in one consummate theory that translates them all between each other. We don't have that yet, but we're working on it. Okay. Um, so, knowledge about matters of fact depends on causal knowledge. The next natural question to ask is, how do I learn about those causal relationships? How do I know that only human beings make pocket watches? That's the next big question. Um, okay, I'm at an hour right now, and I'm thinking that I want to save the next big step for Wednesday. I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do that, because this is a big download of stuff. How are you guys feeling there in the chat? Is this uh, kind of sad? Oh, you guys want to hear the rest of the story? Uh, yeah. Mm, it's kind of a, This is a kind of a cliffhanger, because we haven't yet gotten to the problem of induction. We're still setting it up. We're still on the trail trying to track down how we could have knowledge about matters of fact. And the next step is definitely the doozy. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what to do. Hmm. Well, first let me give you guys a code. Um. Let's have the code tonight be billiard balls. Billiard balls. Okay. Um, that is the code for this evening. Billiard balls. That's the code. All right. Uh, because Hume talks about billiard balls, and it's kind of classic example here for all this stuff. Um, hmm. Okay. I got four people in the chat. So, yeah. Uh, of the four of you guys, I mean, if I went on to talk to this, it's going to become, it's going to be another probably 20 minutes or something at least. So, what do you guys think? Can you tolerate the pain of the cliffhanger? Yeah, I do too. I'm not feeling so hot. Okay, alright, we're going to do it. But, let's uh, let's try to clean some stuff up here. So, Lawrence, you said you're curious what induction was. Have I answered that question for you? And are there any other questions? Here, I'll put this back up here too so you guys can... There's anything about this especially. The question about induction is only half answered, Lawrence. What are you still wondering about it? Oh, how it relates to causality. Okay. So, 
induction is fallible. That's the big thing that separates it from deduction. So the like the logic proof that I had earlier, this uh, process of elimination sort of thing, P or Q, not P, therefore Q, um, that holds with necessity. There's no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Any argument that is inductive just means that it doesn't fit that standard. That any inductive like this, kind of we as we, you guys were pointing out in the in the chat here, this is an inductive argument because the premises can be true and the conclusion false. It's possible for that to happen. Even in, if in the actual world this is true and this is true, it still is possible for this to be true and this to be false. That means that this being true doesn't provide a total guarantee for this to be being true, but it still gives me evidence. It still gives me something that suggests that the conclusion actually is true. It's a good reason to think that the conclusion is true. That's all that induction requires. Now, the next big step here is on what basis can I even get that connection? How could this count as a reason to think that this is true? How are these things connected? It requires a causal law that's going to do that. The causal law that says, let's, let's write it out here. So instead of it just being enthematic, that is the fancy word. Enthematic means that it, it was unspoken. It's an argument with an unstated premise. Let's state it. And this will be pretty um, strongly worded, but I, I think we can bear with it, okay? Um, only humans cause pocket watches to exist. So what if we put that claim in there? So we're going to pop that up here into the suppressed premise spot, okay? And now this claim connects this state of affairs with this state of affairs. That allows this to count as a reason or to count as evidence for this being true. Okay? Even though, even with this thing sort of going on, well, actually, now that we've worried it a little bit strongly, it might start looking deductive. But um, they're basically, the causality connection here is that in order for this to even count as evidence, for it to, like, let's say I say um, not only humans, but most of the time, humans cause pocket watches to exist. That would be all it would take in order for this to now count as evidence for this to be true. I needed something to bridge this support relation between these two claims, and the causal law is what does that. It's what sort of connects those two states of affairs together. It says when this happens, then this happens. Right? So um, that that is why uh, induction is going to involve causality. Does that help? Does that make sense? Cool. Cool. Awesome. Guys, don't be afraid to ask questions. The stupid questions, I mean, stupid questions, whatever. If you're like, I'm not so sure that's a really question I should ask, or I think I should be able to figure it out, or whatever, don't worry about that. I would rather you guys ask whatever questions you have, because I know that there are other people who are asking those same questions. Uh, some I've had some people in, in this quarter who have like come up to me with questions outside of class. And I'm like, I wish you had brought that up because that's a really important question. And I, then I go and read the – I, like, answer the question for that student. And then I'm, like, reading the journals at the end of the week and, like, you know, like a dozen people were, like, having the same confusion or were making a similar mistake or something like that. So, oh, come on. Something that's relevant, Rob. I know you're being silly goofball. Um, something that's relevant to what we're talking about tonight. But, I'm, I mean, how – am I just making perfect sense? Am I just a – Boom, just knocking it out of the park as a lecturer. I kind of think that there's probably something that I could, even if I'm doing a great job, there's probably some more I could be doing. Oh, thanks. I try. Anything at all? Any questions at all? Okay. Okay. All right. Well. Hopefully, to all those of you guys who are watching this on YouTube um, or the next day, that you will also have some questions uh, and write them down and bring them to class. Because I definitely, I'm going to spend Wednesday um, going over this stuff and, and finishing up the problem of induction. Because we haven't even put the problem of induction down yet. We definitely got to do that. But this is really, the problem of induction will not make any sense if you don't understand these distinctions. Um, it really will be unclear what is taking place. So. Um, Definitely come and bring your questions, and we'll try to answer all of your questions 
on Wednesday. So I'll see you then. Good night, everyone.